thank you for inviting me. Both my husband, Jim, and I were active members in a camera club in Pennsylvania. Jim is my photo mentor and my partner in photography, so I'll mention him a few times. Um, and I will take a pause about a little past halfway through for some questions, and I will open it up again at the end. So motion photography, I mean, gosh, there are so many different interpretations. We can freeze a moment in time. We can capture a special moment. We can use techniques to manipulate motion or stretch it out to see things in a different way. We can use motion to create a mood or feeling. So here are some of the motion techniques that I will cover. I'm gonna talk about freezing action, long exposure, panning and zooming, rear curtain sink. Of course, you have to talk about photographing water if you're talking about motion. Neutral density filters. We'll do some light painting motion, which is fun, and a fun toy called a pixel stick. And I will wrap up with some fun tricks and Photoshop ideas to stimulate motion. And most of the images I will show are mine, but I have included a few by my husband, Jim. He's the guilty party who got me into photography about 10 years ago. And he's a very talented photographer, but he's also my technical support. I tend to focus a little bit more on the artistic side of things. I can sometimes be a little bit technically challenged. And I find it's always a challenge creating a presentation for a diverse audience with all different levels of experience. I'm sure like most camera clubs, some of your members are just starting out, want to learn the basics. And I'm sure you also have very many experienced photographers. So I'm gonna start out with some basics and gradually add some more advanced techniques. And I find that there is always something new to learn and some new technique to try out. Most of this presentation will involve in-camera techniques, but I will finish up with some post-processing ideas. And I like to start with a little bit of history. You may be familiar with this famous photograph by Henri Cartier-Bresson. It is often used to illustrate what is known as the decisive moment. You know, when the visual and psychological elements of a scene briefly come together. I mean, not only did he capture the motion of the man's feet suspended above the water, but look at how the reflection in the water, it, it mirrors the circus poster in the background. And I love this image of his of a cyclist. So it's believed that he would find his composition and wait for the cyclist to move in that exact desired position, another decisive moment. So these are examples of freezing a moment in time. But let's move on to an image that shows motion and we're gonna settle a little bit. So it was a long time ago, there was this businessman named Leland Stanford who owned racehorses and he needed to settle a little bet with some of his buddies. He said when his horse was racing, all four legs came off the ground at the same time. No one had ever seen this, so no one believed it. Well, he paid photographer Edward Moybridge to prove his point, and Moybridge set up a series of 12 cameras along the track that were triggered by the horse tripping the wires that set off those shutter releases. And you can see he won his bet in the third image on the top, all four legs are off the ground. Let's move to a single image that shows motion. Philadelphia artist, Thomas Eakins, he was also a photographer and he developed his own method with the goal of studying anatomy to further his paintings. So whereas Moybridge's system relied on a series of 12 cameras triggered to produce multiple photos, Eakins used a single camera to produce a series of exposures superimposed on one negative. And I wanna mention one more. Ansel Adams was 25 years old when he created this image of monolith of half dome. And he first used a yellow filter to darken the sky a bit, but his experience of what he saw was more dramatic than he knew he would get with that yellow filter. So after, after hiking up a mountain with all this, this heavy gear, he had only one glass plate left and he tried a new red filter hoping it would darken the sky to create the image he imagined or visualized. 
And this experiment proved to be a turning point for Ansel Adams because for the first time, he was conscious of the difference between what his camera lens saw and what he saw in his mind's eye as the final print. He discovered photographic visualization, a concept I will mention again later. So we'll be talking a lot about either freezing time or capturing a period of time, either using a fast shutter speed or a slow shutter speed. So cameras have a mode dial, either shutter priority marked on it. So set your mode dial to either S for shutter, or on some cameras, it says TV for time value to activate your shutter priority mode. So this means you tell the camera how long you want the exposure to be. And in most cases, you can let the camera decide the rest. So let's start with the most basic of techniques of motion photography. And of course, that's freezing action. And fast exposures can freeze actions that happen faster than the blink of an eye. This was shot at one two thousandth of a second. And you know, people ask about settings, so I will include the aperture and ISO on many of these images. But the most important factor here is shutter speed. A skateboarder in Central Park, frozen in midair at one five hundredth of a second. Here's my husband, Jim, just tossing cherry blossoms in the air. More skateboard antics. This one was taken by Jim. And here I like to imagine what thoughts must be going on in the minds of that couple with their feet in the air in the water. <laughs> so fast shutter speeds are almost always used to capture sports events, to freeze the action. And when photographing wildlife, like this grizzly bear in British Columbia, I wanted to be sure to freeze any movement to get a sharp image. So, you know, one five hundredth of a second can freeze action. For faster action, like birds in flight, you probably want to go with maybe one one thousandth, one two thousandth of a second. So these images were all taken with the camera set to shutter priority. A hippo thrashing about while sparring with another hippo. And he was moving fast, so a very fast shutter speed was used to freeze the action. And I want to point out the magic of a fast shutter speed. I am not a bird photographer, but I did have a goal of capturing a hummingbird, so at least I got these shots. And I included this to make a point about motion. Think about the speed of a hummingbird's wings. They flap, or actually they're making a figure eight movement, an average of 50 times per second much faster than you can see with your eyes. So think about the bet on that feet of that racehorse that no one had ever actually seen all four feet in the air. Without high-speed photography, we would never see the wing of a hummingbird in flight. And a great place to practice capturing motion not far from where I live is a place called Middle Creek Wildlife Management Area. And in late February, early March, tens of thousands of Beautiful snow geese stop here, and it's just an amazing sight and sound when they all lift up in unison. And close to sunset, they fly in from the fields to roost on the lake for night. And this is a good example of what your camera can see, but your eye cannot. You know, sort of like a, like a ceiling fan uh, spinning around and you can't see the individual fan blades. These snow geese, they, they flew and circled, and when you're there, you experience this amazing motion, but your eye cannot freeze and see the scene like your camera can. And these are tundra swans at Middle Creek, and I think they can be quite graceful when flying overhead. And another fast shutter speed to freeze the action of a street performer. <laughs> so Jim and I were fortunate to go on a photography club trip uh, to Cuba, where we visited a local dance studio and it was dim in the room with bright light pouring in from these back windows. So you can see here, not the best lighting conditions. But so in this case, I set my camera, a Sony A6000, to an automatic preset called sport mode, which means the camera will pick all the settings needed to freeze the action. So it has a very high ISO of 3200, which can create some noise or a bit of a grainy look. But for me, I would prefer to have some noise in the image and be able to capture unique dance actions rather than have a perfect quality shot and miss the whole point. And we also attended a performance by a Santeria dance troupe. And Santeria is an Afro-Cuban religion, and the dancers perform this frenzied trance-like dance to drums that's very fascinating. At one two hundredth of a second, 
fast enough to freeze most of the action, but you start to see a little bit of a blur on the dress and the hair. So those examples were all done with natural light, but the burst of a flash is much faster than the shutter speed of your camera. To really capture high-speed movement, it is best to use a flash. So although the shutter speed is 1 2 50th of a second, the motion is frozen by the flash, which is actually faster, you know, maybe as fast as 1 10,000th of a second. So these were done at home just by dropping colorful objects into a fish tank. And you do need to, to pre-focus where you think your subject will be as it happens way too fast for any type of autofocus to work. So here's the setup if you want to try this at home. And, and by the way, I'll have a link to our website at the end that has all this information on it. But you need a fish tank, of course, with a dark background behind it. Um, that squeegee is there because some little bubbles form on the inside of the glass. And then you do pre-focus on an object. I have this hammer in here with a piece of blue tape. So I focus on that, gently pull out the hammer, set my camera to manual focus so it doesn't change. And then use an off-camera flash coming in from the side. And you have a friend drop fruit or other objects into your fish tank and find a friend who doesn't mind getting a little wet. So here's some other items that I played with. So, hey, look around your house, see what you can experiment with or get into the action yourself. And you know what? Don't be afraid to get wet. <laughs> At 1 60th of a second, you would not freeze those bubbles unless you used a flash. But if you don't have a fish tank or an external flash, you can still create images like these. I, I picked up this um, flat sided clear plexiglass vase at the dollar store that works well for this. Just set up a strong desk light for some side lighting and use some seltzer water. Capturing the motion of smoke is fun. Just burn some incense and use a flash. And with high speed flash, you can capture the splash of water droplets colliding. So you need special timing equipment for shots like this, which we don't have. I shot these at a local workshop where they had the, the fancy equipment. Uh, here you can see it's quite a complex setup with there's colored water dropping from the above and water shooting up from below so that those water drops actually hit together. <laughs> Way too technical for me. And at that same workshop, we played with high speed flash while smashing things like wine glasses or shooting a pretzel with a BB gun. You can actually see the BB right there going through that pretzel. And yeah, we made quite a mess. A mess. And here you can see the, uh, the BBs coming out of this exploded egg. And we had some fun with high-speed flash with a dart thrown at water balloons. And somehow this equipment is triggered so that it flash goes off right when that dart hits the balloon. So <clears throat> that was all high-speed flash. Well, images can be recorded in a fraction of a second or over much longer periods of time fraction of a second, the movement is frozen. Now it's slowed down to 1 15th of a second, introducing some blur and allowing the camera to capture the movement of the birds. And I think even with wildlife, I, I think longer shutter speeds can lead to surprising new images. So, you know, experiment with different shutter speeds to make creative photographs. Fast shutter speed, slower shutter speed, Neither one is right or wrong, just depends on what you're trying to convey. I love this capture by Jim. It's one of those snow geese at Middle Creek. And here's one of mine, quite surreal, maybe a little bit haunting, I think. Or slow that shutter down a bit to capture the motion of snow flying in an open window. If I had shot this at 1 500th of a second or faster, the snow would have been captured as tiny specks instead of these streaks which gives more a feel of motion. And time exposures can allow us to record, record things we can't see with the naked eye. You know, we can stretch out those streaks of light, the headlights on the left, the taillights on the right. And I love trying to capture a mix of static objects and moving objects, the people standing motionless while the train speeds by. And with a long shutter speed, people in motion start to take on ghost-like qualities. 
quite abstract, but you can still tell this is a train speeding by. And this was a highway. The cars were probably doing, I don't know, 60 miles per hour. So this was a two second exposure to capture those streaks of light. But in a small downtown, the cars are moving much slower. So this was eight seconds and the camera's on a tripod, which <laughs> of course is a must when doing an eight second exposure. And this is the same downtown from the roof of the public parking lot. And the roof actually has this high cement wall around it. I actually had to raise the tripod in the, in the air and brace the tripod legs against the cement wall to get the camera high enough to get this shot. So I kind of had to guess at the direction of the camera. Lucky guess. All right, so let's move on. Setting up the scene and waiting for something to happen like Henri Cartier-Bresson's famous image, believed that he would scout out his composition and then wait to capture that precisely timed, meaningful moment, find a good location, then wait for subject matter to enter the frame and complete the composition. So here are a series of images by my husband, Jim. This is at a reenactment of the revolutionary Battle of the Brandywine. And he was attracted to the repeating patterns of the soldier's tent. So he just kept moving around and, you know, he framed a nice composition of the leading lines through these two rows of tents. And every so often, some of the soldiers would walk through the frame. So he just stayed there for a while, hoping to capture someone of interest at just the right moment. And there it is. When this young soldier walked through with the drum on his back, he felt he had something special. And I agree. I had the same idea in Cuba. I was fascinated by the colors and shapes of this painted wall, the peeling paint on the door. So I just sat on the curb across the street and I watched the people going by. And this guy in the pink cap, he wasn't going anywhere. And then I noticed that the low sun was creating some dramatic shadows on that wall. And I thought, oh, Gosh, can I get the man with the cap perhaps showing an interaction with a shadow? And then it happened. Here's my finished shot. I think it's graphically pleasing. And I love the story and the expression on this man's face. Another example by Jim at Grand Central Terminal in New York City. Bright sunlight was pouring in at this low angle, creating these long shadows. And he positioned himself in the middle of the commotion and waited. And he started out by framing the people. Then he tilted the camera down. He started to focus less on the people and more on the shadows. And again, he's just waiting for something interesting. And here it is. This was the decisive moment. The foot on the left and the foot on the right, you know, they're both lifted off the floor, showing the movement. And the shadow of the little girl holding her father's hand that captured the moment he was waiting for. Okay, intentional camera movement. So up until now, we've held the camera steady and either frozen motion or allowed motion to move and be captured. Let's shake that up a bit. Now we move the camera. Intentional camera movement or ICM as is sometimes referred to, Kind of a different branch of photography altogether and you know the final result produces um, uh, a blurred colorful maybe abstract image and so think of it as being like an expressionist painter and panning is one of the most popular ICM techniques it is easy and fun and using a slower shutter speed maybe 1 30th 1 15th of a second you swipe your camera up or down you are panning your subject sometimes called swipes. <laughs> and part of the fun of panning is that you never really know how your image will turn out. This is another example of how our eyes and the camera see things differently. If you look at a tree with your eyes and move your head up and down, you will likely see the tree well-defined, but the camera doesn't. It sees a blur. And you can do this with a tripod, just kind of loosen the ball head, but I usually do it handheld. I will brace my elbows against my sides uh, to try to keep the camera as steady and not have too much jiggle going on. Um, trees, I think, work really well because you, you get this dreamy kind of surreal image, but you still recognize the subject. And it does take a lot of experimentation and be prepared to delete a lot of misses. 
This one has a bit of a shake in it, giving it a different sort of staccato or jumpy feel. But it doesn't have to be trees. It can work well with flowers. You probably recognize this as of tulips. And you know, I like to just plop down on the ground and play with this technique. I really like the abstract movement effect. This one is not recognizable, but very abstract. It's just a bunch of colorful autumn leaves. And I like to experiment with other subjects and go beyond nature. There's an old steel factory near us called Steel Stacks, and I love photographing the structures and the colorful rust and, you know, the colors and the patterns are fantastic, but how about a motion blur here? Very abstract, but beautiful. At the Naval Shipyard in Philadelphia, just a small panning blur gives it a ghost-like effect. The ocean, now the panning is horizontal, so a little bit different. But on all of these examples, the camera is moving this way or this way, but the subject is not. Let's go back to Cuba, a different kind of panning. Now, both the subject and the camera are moving. We follow our subject with the camera, and this hopefully allows us to get the subject relatively sharp and blur the background. So you try to match the subject's rate of movement and the direction in which it's traveling. And so basically you're just swiveling your camera along a parallel axis to the moving subject and you hope to get at least a part of your, your subject in focus. So these colorful old cars, they were a distance away from me. So I'm panning in about this speed. I'm going swipe, swipe. Now it gets really crazy. This is a velodrome in Pennsylvania, and these cyclists were very close to my camera, so the panning has to take much faster. Now I'm going like this, swipe, swipe. <laughs> so all you see in focus here is this guy's knee and this explosion of motion in front of him, an explosion of motion behind him. And you get some crazy stuff, and it can be quite surreal, but I love the effect created by the spinning of the spokes. So if you want to try this, again, put your camera on shutter priority mode. Um, start maybe with 1 30th, 1 15th of a second and make your adjustments. It depends on how far you are from your subject and how fast your subject is moving. And just keep practicing. And I find that it helps if you kind of keep following your subject even after the shutter is closed. Otherwise, you can kind of prematurely drop your camera. And be prepared to take lots of frames of which most will be throwaways. But I enjoy surprises of bizarre, somewhat ghostly images like this. Here are a few I took at another event called a cyclocross event, which is so much fun to watch and photograph. And I just, I love how the wheels just sort of disappear into the track. And this guy was coming down a hill. So now I had to pan in a diagonal motion. That was new for me. <laughs> And I got pretty messy getting this one. It had rained the day before, which made a muddy mess. Lots of fun to watch and photograph. And I really like this one too. I think it has a kind of a clear impression of speed and a colorful and strong composition. And what a fantastic opportunity to be at the finish line of the Boston Marathon. In my dreams, <laughs> I, was, I was watching it on TV. And I thought I would just love to be in that camera car that goes along with those amazing runners. And then I realized that from my living room couch, I, I kind of was in the camera car. And I wondered, can I do some panning motion? Why not try? So I slowed my shutter speed down to one tenth of a second. And I took a gazillion bad shots, but I got a few that I liked. And, you know, technically, these are not my shots, as I am shooting from video taken by another photographer. So I won't be entering these into any competition. But I'm still experimenting with yet another way to capture motion. That's how I learn. Now let's add a new twist to intentional camera motion. And by new twist, I do mean that literally. A normal picture of a colorful autumn tree. But if we twist our zoom lens, you get some wonderful zoom motion. So you either, you know, zoom, you can zoom in or zoom out. Either way works. <laughs> uh, just while your shutter is open. Autumn trees with no zoom. 
and now with just a slight zoom. And I think this has quite an impressionistic look. Cityscapes can be fun. Or just a subtle zoom on, night, on neon lights for a new look. Or try a rotation blur. So this is different. Now I take the entire, I'm now just rotating the entire camera while the shutter is open. <laughs> and then there's a mistake. I do this a lot, by the way. I didn't even know I took this shot. Not sure if you would call this a zoom or panning or what. I was up on this ladder to get above the sunflower field. And I don't know, I must have pushed the shutter button on the way down. But I think it's kind of fun. And a perfect time to practice these motion techniques is with holiday lights. So here is the traditional Christmas tree shot. But watch what happens after I have a glass of wine. It's having a bit more fun. <laughs> I like that. I think I'll have another. And with some more wine, it is really starting to party. Disco party. <laughs> Okay, this one may have been after a little bit too much wine. It's actually a combination of a zoom and rotating the camera at the same time. Again, a combination of panning, twisting, and a zoom blur. Basically, a hangover. <laughs> so these are actually holiday lights on an outdoor tree. I read an article by Olympus about doing these rotational blurs, and I decided to try it out. So I put the camera underneath a lit tree and spun the camera and a crop of one of my experiments. This is, of course, very abstract, but I, I like how you can see the effect of those pulsating lights. Uh, so these were hard to set up and try to get the camera on a tripod pointing straight up. And, you know, as usual, I wound up with some surprises. <laughs> it was freezing cold out. I had my gloves on. I probably hit the shutter and didn't even know it. So I got home and I had this image and I thought, wow, that's different. I kind of like it. All right, let's move on to water because we can't have a conversation about motion photography without talking about water. I think water is one of the best subjects to experiment with different shutter speeds to get very different results. Fast shutter speed to capture and freeze the motion of water flowing over a sand dollar <laughs> or slow down to freeze the subject but blur the moving tide as the water sweeps back to the ocean. But uh, if you try this, hold on to your tripod. I almost lost a camera as the, the ocean almost swept it away. And this one is somewhere in between. At one tenth of a second, the splashes hitting the rocks kind of appear stretched out and are emphasized. Uh, this great blue heron was flying in one direction over rapids going in the opposite direction. So to freeze the motion, very high shutter speed was needed. And of course, we have to talk about waterfalls. How do you get that smooth water flow? Some call it maybe a silky or cotton candy look. Do you wanna get that look? That's up to you. Here you see the detail in the water, the crunchiness of it, relatively fast shutter. Same scene with the shutter opened longer with that silky look. And again, neither approach is right or wrong, whatever you like. So let's talk about waterfalls doing different shutter speeds. So here's the same flowing water at different shutter speeds. So I started out at one one thousandth of a second. Now it's slowed down to one fifteenth of a second. You see, it's already got quite a different look. Let's slow it down to one sixth of a second. It's even smoother. And now a full half a second. Um, so I just wanted to show what a different look you get with different shutter speeds. But now let's get into how shutter speed affects exposure because the more time your shutter is open, the more light comes in to your camera. So for these examples, I have switched to manual mode, which of course means I am in control of all the camera settings. I started at 1 250th of a second and froze the moving water. Notice it's sort of crunchy in the foreground. Now at 1 15th of a second, a blur starts to occur still fairly sharp in that pool area in the center. Now it's a bit overexposed because I'm on manual, but that could be adjusted by lowering the ISO. Now at a full second, notice swirls are starting to form in the pool and the waterfall and cascading water in the foreground have a smoother appearance. 
At two seconds, even more motion is captured, but it's a bit overexposed. My ISO is 200. Let's cut that in half to 100 and see what happens. Same two seconds. So the look of the water is basically the same, but at ISO 100, the exposure looks pretty good. What happens if we go to four seconds to go for an even smoother cotton candy look? Well, now so much light is coming in that the image is again overexposed. I'm already at the lowest ISO my camera has. Well, yeah, I know some of you are saying you could change the f-stop, but for this example, I'll leave that constant. Instead, I will add a neutral density filter on the front of the lens, kind of like putting on sunglasses, and while that, that will cut down the light. So by adding that filter to cut down some light, the exposure looks much better, and I now have that smooth, dreamy look to the water. And here's one more at a full six seconds. Maybe too much smoothing out of the water for you, but that's up to you as an artist. A few more waterfalls to be sure the surrounding landscape is in focus during a long exposure. Of course, a, a tripod is essential. I can now check this one off my bucket list, a spectacular and very popular waterfall in Oregon. And one of the largest waterfalls in Iceland with this drop of almost 200 feet. And you can walk right up to the base of it and you get wet, but, but it's worth it. I do love this lone figure just dwarfed by the power of nature. And a very different image of water flowing and serene. This was of the swells created off the back of a power boat. And the beautiful fountains at Longwood Gardens in Pennsylvania. And they don't allow tripods during their fountain show. So this was handheld and I was somewhat far away. So you can see this has a very high ISO of 16,000, which again creates some noise, but it doesn't bother me. And we don't always have perfect weather conditions. While photographing in a Pennsylvania State Park, Jim and I took cover in our car just before this huge storm blew through. So we were trapped in the car. What do I do? I took shots through the windshield of the pouring rain at varying shutter speeds. And when the rain let up, I captured this graceful flow of water. And this was taken on a bright sunny day. There was a sprinkler going and the sunlight highlighted the streaks of water. And then I turned a bit and this is the effect of two sprinklers crossing paths. And this one, this might be a bit difficult to figure out. You get the sense of water flowing, but the image is a bit abstract. Is that some kind of rabbit from Mars swimming through rapids? Well, it's actually simulated motion, as in reality, nothing is moving, might start to make sense in its original vertical orientation. It's a macro image of an icicle. So still talking about water, Jim and I do all sorts of wacky photo experiments, and we wanted to capture wine splashing out of the side of a wine glass. You know, you may have seen this on some wine labels, you know, like the expensive wine that I buy that comes in the big cardboard box. <laughs> so Jim built this ramp and, uh, and put a little wooden stop down here at the bottom so that when the wine glasses slid down, they would hit it the idea of causing the liquid to flow up and out of the side of the glass. And, you know, this took a lot of practice and we're getting closer. We're almost there. That's kind of what we're looking for. Time to add some food coloring. Oops, we had a casualty. All right, that's kind of what we're looking for. And we got some random splashes. Finally got a pretty good one. Cropped in tighter for the final image and gave it a high key look. Okay, here comes another mistake. So <laughs> paddling back from a, a twilight canoe trip, I was intrigued by the reflections on the houses on the lake. And I think Jim intentionally rocked the boat because this is what I got, but I love it. I think it looks like curved Asian boats in front of a mountain range, you know, quite peaceful and almost mystical. So I do want to describe a bit more about neutral density filters as they can make quite a difference. Here's the ocean in Acadia in Maine hitting the rocks. You can see the crunchy detail at 1 1 25th of a second. But maybe you want to go for a different look, smooth out that water a bit. But going to a full six seconds on a bright sunny day, it would look something like this. Way too much light is coming into your camera. And you can't adjust any settings to get a good exposure 
when your shutter is letting in bright sunlight for a full six seconds. So you have to put those sunglasses on the front of your lens, a neutral density filter. Okay, so they're all different types of neutral density filters. If you can kind of see through this, right? This is a two-stop neutral density filter, blocks out kind of like light sunglasses. This is a six-stop neutral density filter. You probably can't see through it. You can stack them to go eight stops of neutral density. So depending what you're doing, you change your neutral density filters. And I love doing this with clouds because clouds take on this mysterious feel when stretched out using neutral density filters and a long exposure. So on all these, I'm using the same f-stop and ISO, only the time changes. I started at 1 125th of a second, no filters. Now this is eight seconds. That's a long exposure. And I've got uh, eight stops of neutral density on. Now I'm going a full 30 seconds. So it's the same clouds. You see the same trees there, same time of day. The only thing that's changed is the length of the exposure. And I've had to put on more sunglasses. And this is the same image, just converted to black and white, just because I really like this technique of clouds in black and white. A beautiful sunset of the Philadelphia skyline. And I like these clouds but they take on a whole different look when stretched out over three minutes. And again, I really like black and white with this look. Okay, we are finally done with water, something different. How would you go about capturing the motion of tiny dandelion seeds flying off flower heads? Scanning. The camera is a flatbed scanner. This is just a scanner we bought to scan documents called a Canon Canascan. The image on the left shows how tomatoes and onions were placed on the scanner. This is the resulting image on the right. Notice that everything is not only upside down, it's backwards. <laughs> so this is what an arrangement looks like as it's placed on the scanner. Looks like quite a mess, doesn't it? Here is the scan from that mess. So on the right, on the bottom, you see a big white mayapple flower, smaller mayapple flower covered with a sprig of azalea. Over here on the left, as it's placed on the scanner, there's the big mayapple flower, the smaller one, and the sprig of azalea. So hopefully you get the idea of what's going on. And here is how I use this to simulate motion. Um, I place these jewelweed seed pods uh, to make it look like they were popping open. I just laid the pieces on the scanner to make it look like an exploding plant. Lettuce, tomatoes, peppers, kind of gently falling to create this beautiful salad. Well, this actually is a composite of two images as the, the floating veggies were done on the scanner, but the bowl on the bottom was just a straight on camera shot. And then the two were combined in Photoshop. How about a fireworks explosion of hosta buds? Okay, now I'm really getting a bit cookie, kooky. <laughs> I took a CD and I pulled it down along the scanner as the light followed it down. Those are my hands. Those are my fingers at the bottom there. <laughs> and I placed some old keys, an antique stopwatch, and some beautiful chrysanthemums on the scanner. And I wondered what would happen if I left them on the scanner and did a scan every day for three weeks. So watch carefully. You'll see the flowers start to change to wither, their color starts to fade to brown. I just love experimenting any way I can think of to simulate motion. And with scanning, you can simulate the magic of milkweed seed pods floating away. I don't know how you could capture this out in a field. Okay, so we are past the halfway point, by the way, and I've been talking kind of fast, so I think I'm on time. So um, Dave, if you want to open it up for any questions now, see if there might be any questions now, and that'll make it a little shorter at the end for questions. So that would mean you have to unmute and um, I probably won't hear people in your audience. So if you want to oh, unmute, and if anyone wants to ask a question, you might need to repeat it. Okay, I think we can uh, use microphones to handle this, so. That would be great. Let me see if anybody has a question first off. Yeah, let's do that. Uh, 
Hey. Ah, I can see everybody. Cliff, time to wake up. <laughs> what can you tell us about the scanner you were using? Okay, the scanner I'm using, it's called a Canon Canna Scan 8600 is the model. Um, when we bought it, it was like $130, I think. We looked recently and they now go for about $300, but it's not anything real fancy. We just bought this to scan like household documents, but it has very high resolution. So you get really strong detail with it. Well, Any so other questions? You. Any other questions? Everybody's looking at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, they know that, I guess, but wait, hang on. Jean has a question. Okay. So I have a question about rear curtain sink. I know that sure. we're co covering that. I will be covering that next, actually. Oh, never mind then. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I know we're on a tight timeline. Um, so I will continue and we will go right on to rear curtain sink. How do you like that? If it was a gene, there you go. <laughs> so um, when shooting with flash and using a slow shutter speed, you can record movement and freeze it at the same time. So here I held up four golf balls. Jim opened the shutter. I dropped the golf balls. They bounced down, bounced back up, suspended for a fraction of a second right there before coming back down and then flash. The flash went off to freeze those golf balls there. So I did a selfie here with a, a 10 second delay on the timer. So there is a setting in most cameras called rear curtain sync. So basically when you, when you take a shot, the first curtain opens, letting the light into your camera. Then at the end of the exposure, the second curtain closes and then they reset and they're ready for the next shot. Well, with rear curtain sync, it opens up and with ambient light, action is moving. And then near the end of your shot, flash, and then it closes. So you can see the motion as I move around with the ambient light and then the flash goes off at the end. So something is in focus. And I experimented with some light sticks and probably some wine while Jim is in the room behind me trying to ignore me. <laughs> and we played around with this, trying to make it work. This is a two second exposure as I move through the flame, through, through the frame. And again, the flash goes off at the end. And I, I like this one. I think it kind of looks like my hair blew off. And we had this mottled gray background set up, which is why you see sort of a, a smoky textured look. And I like that textured look, but this isn't quite what we were trying to achieve. So I asked for a black background for my birthday. This is the look we wanted to create with the black background. And I relied on Jim as my lighting expert. So to the, to the right, up here is a, um, a continuous light and a big soft box to diffuse and spread the light. And that's providing the light as I'm jumping around over here. And then at the left is a speed light, a flash, that flashes at the end of the exposure to freeze this portion of the action. And another from the same photo shoot. Jim says I look like an angel. Ah. All right. So... Let's talk a little bit about light painting, light art performance photography, not only a mouthful, it's a style in which you literally paint your pictures with light. And this is fun. And the crazy part is it's created with only one picture, no Photoshop skills needed. You just grab a light and experiment. Uh, if I was in the room with you, I'd ask you to guess how I did this. Maybe some of you can guess. Jim and I are avid canoeists and we attached a string of LED lights to a canoe paddle. And this is the motion of the paddle as Jim paddles in the dark and I take a 30 second shot. And another done the same way. Maybe some of you have done this fire spinning done by swinging steel wool that's been set on fire. Our camera club hosted a, a workshop and we did this at a safe location at a firefighter training location. And with a slow shutter speed of 10 seconds, you capture this rain of sparks flying down. And of course we did something similar at home. So now Jim has me holding a grinder on a piece of sheet metal to create those flying sparks. 
And this is actually another example of rear curtain sync as it's a fairly long exposure of half a second to show the spray of those flying sparks and then the flash to light me at the end of the exposure. And then the next thing I know, Jim asked me to wear my dark exercise clothes and then he's wrapping these colorful string lights around me. Now what is he trying to do? This. He had me run through the frame when it was dark enough. So again, a combination of that light painting or LAPP and rear curtain sink as the flash was burst at the end to freeze the image of me. And this one usually stumps people. How was this done? Well, we have a friend, Charles, who loves playing with all sorts of toys to create light motion. And Charles did a workshop for our club. So you can see here a bicycle tire with lights placed around the rim. And here you can see it in the dark and get the idea of how it spins around on the floor and four seconds for it to go around in one rotation. And this is Charles just walking through the frame, kind of moving that bicycle wheel around. Charles is now holding his lightsaber. And this image gives you an idea of what's going on. This is what the image looks like in the dark. So let's now talk about long exposures with multiple flash going off. Now we paint with bursts of light. This is a single frame of just two dancers. A tripod is a must. You set it up in pre-focus, then turn out the lights, leave the shutter open for eight seconds, a burst of flash from a speed light was manually triggered four times to freeze the dancers in motion. So flash, 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 flash. This is also eight seconds. The flash was shot five times. So this was done at that workshop by our friend Charles. But of course, Jim and I have to try this at home. So <laughs> this was done with a Canon speed light set in multi-mode which means it was preset to fire five bursts per second for three seconds. So you get 15 images. Um, this is sort of a rather surreal image, but this is what it started out like. And I'd show this to you because I wanted you to know we made many attempts at this and most were just a confusing jumble. Hard to tell what the heck you're looking at, but I kind of like that jumble of hands at the bottom. So I took Jim's image and converted it to black and white and cropped in on that. This one worked a bit better. Jim lowered the number of flash bursts from 15 down to nine. So I think it, it looks a bit less jumbled. <laughs> I think I'm about to punch myself in the face. And we again experimented at a, another flash workshop. Here we have multiple flashes going off while this skeleton was slowly pushed across the floor in a chair with wheels on it. So Jim and I brought along the model. We call him Uncle Dudley. And I don't remember who had the idea to put shades on Uncle Dudley. I think it looks like men in black. So pixel stick. Jim was awarded this toy at one of our camera club celebrations. And there are actually 200 tiny LED lights along the edge of this stick. And the pixel stick comes with a dozen built-in patterns, different colors, rainbow patterns, and if you wave the stick about a bit while walking, it creates these really cool patterns. And this is that pre-programmed rainbow pattern. And you can create a lot of fun stuff like this. So here, Jim asked me to hold the pixel stick close to the ground and walk through our woods. So let's add a person to the shot. We asked our friend to pose as still as possible while we walked behind her with the pixel stick. So she appears in silhouette. Remember that rear curtain flash? Now we've used that technique with the pixel stick. So you can see me over here uh, on the far left as I'm finishing walking up the pixel stick behind Jim. And at the end of the exposure, we've added a flash. So now Jim has been lit up and frozen as the flash burst was very fast. Another example, this time I am the subject. But here's where it gets really crazy. You can load your own image into the pixel stick. Each one of its 200 LEDs acts like a pixel on a screen, displaying your image one vertical line at a time. So here we have our friend Bob set up like he is raising a glass to himself. Well, we already had this picture of Bob and we downloaded this picture into the pixel stick. 
Then we asked Bob to sit in the dark, hold up his beer bottle and sit still. He had no idea what we were doing. That other image of Bob is in the stick. And as Jim walks by, slices of the photo flash. All you see at the time is this weird stick that's blinking lights. It actually looks kind of like this. And then when Jim was done walking with the stick, we lit Bob with a burst of flash. Alas, the end result is real Bob and virtual Bob together. This is a single frame. It is not Photoshopped. For this one, I'm actually sitting in a canoe that's on a picnic table. So Jim builds and restores wooden canoes, and this is one he built. We took an image of the ocean and loaded it onto the pixel stick. And then Jim walked by me twice, once with the ocean image on the stick behind me, and then again in front of me. And here, Jim loaded a creepy picture of himself and walked it behind me. He told me to look scared. I had no idea what image was on the stick, but I agree, he looks pretty creepy there. <laughs> All right, what if you are the motion? You've seen examples like this where the photographer and camera are stationary and the subject has movement. Here you see those ghost-like images of the people as they move on the escalator. Well, what happens if the photographer is moving on the escalator. Both the photographer and the camera are moving through something that is stationary. So the escalator steps are sharp as the camera and the steps are both moving together. But the sides of the escalator show the motion as the camera moves up and the sides do not. I had to try this one about 20 times as I was paddling solo and I had to paddle really hard to get the canoe moving and then lay back low to get low and get the shot. And I had a lot of misses. So this is that same canoe that Jim built. But you get the idea. The canoe is sharp as the camera is moving with the canoe while the grass is in the water appear to glide by. Okay, now we're going to take it up yet another level. What if you are in a car going 25 miles per hour while you pan a subject? As the car goes by, you rotate the camera to keep the subject in the frame. You do need two people to do this, a driver and a photographer, and you get this swirly, crazy rotation effect. I'm gonna try to demonstrate here quickly for you. So, this white piece of paper, I don't know if you can see that. That's a tree, and I know you can't see my head, but I think you can see enough of me. The, the road is going behind the tree. I'm in the car. As, the, as we approach the tree, I open the shutter. I'm pointing my camera at the tree, and as the car goes by, I continue pointing it at the tree. So you see how I'm rotating the camera to point it at the tree. So it's, it's actually a combination of lateral movement and rotational movement. And it works great with colorful trees, such as dogwoods or red buds in spring or colorful trees in autumn. Not sure what kind of trees you have out by where you are, but anything colorful would work. But you can also focus on other subjects, such as this is a cabin in Valley Forge, and you can see the rotation effect down there on the grass. Kind of looks like ghosts are leaving the cemetery. And sometimes it results in just this hurricane of texture and color. And I just love this type of photography. It makes me feel the excitement of connecting with the forest as I move through it. And it can be quite abstract, impressions of color and texture. The details are dissolved by the motion, but in most images, maybe there's enough form retained to suggest a sense of subject. So here's the how-to if you wanna try this. Again, uh, these how-to, uh, notes are on our website. Um, you do it from a moving car. You need two people. Don't try this yourself. And you just rotate the camera while you drive past and focus on a tree or whatever. About 25 miles per hour is probably the easiest. I have done it on a highway going 50 or 60. I usually use 1 15th of a second. And it does take a lot of practice. And be prepared to go delete, 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 delete. I'll literally take maybe a hundred images before I get one that I like. Okay, up until now, all of the images with the exception of that falling salad have been done in camera. No Photoshop necessary. Let's look at ways to create or simulate motion 
using some post-processing tools. This looks like a zoom blur, but it's actually a fully focused sunflower. This radial blur was added in Photoshop, and I'm not going to get into any how-to specifics in Photoshop, as that would be a whole other presentation. I just want to share a few ideas of how you can use post-processing to simulate motion. I wanted to capture fireflies and create sort of a magical fairyland look, so I took about 20 shots, each one six seconds, to capture the movement of the lightning bugs. And then it's, you know, it's quite easy to blend them together as layers in Photoshop. Here I started with a normal shot of birch trees. And in this case, I added the blur in Photoshop. But this is different than the panning blurs we did before because I wanted to add some of the bark texture back in. So here in the final image, you see just a hint of the texture. I'm going to go back. No texture, little bit of texture. Um, just a little bit of texture on the bark of these beautifully blurred trees. So this was done by bringing both images into Photoshop as layers and then just brushing a bit of the texture from one image onto the other. Back to setting up the scene and waiting for something to happen. This time I'm going to give it a little Photoshop help. Chelsea Market in New York City and this stretch of flooring that's lit from below. And I loved watching this variety of legs and shoes and I felt them. There had to be a shot, so I sat on a bench and I took lots and lots of shots. Back home at the computer, I like this one with the wheelchair, and I like this one with the colorful shoes, and I thought, well, maybe I can combine the two. Here's my finished image, and this represents the hustle and bustle and diversity that I was experiencing at the time. You know, I didn't even realize until about a month later that the colorful shoes moving out of the frame are actually the same feet walking into the frame, but that's okay. I still like it. Remember this one done in camera using long exposure and rear curtain sync? This motion blur was all done in post-processing by adding a blur filter in Photoshop. And I love the solitude of this lonely figure walking on a shallow beach in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Here's the original image, dust spots and all. Not a great photo, but I like the mood. So I decided to give it a little help in Photoshop and I used the motion blur filter to smooth out those waves. And then I enhanced the color to create the serene scene. This is how I remember the magic of those endless patterns of those shallow waves. A couple of images captured of skateboarders. This is a park in Philadelphia. I like the shadow on this one. And this one caught in midair. <laughs> a second later, this guy was on the ground. These were done, of course, with a fast shutter speed. And I wondered, could I simulate the motion by using multiple images similar to what Thomas Eakins did? And I stood in one place and I put my camera on burst mode and just took a bunch of images. 13 images blended together in Photoshop. And I did the same with the snow geese at Middle Creek. This is about 30 separate exposures of images taken in burst mode and then combined in Photoshop. So as opposed to just freezing birds in flight, I think it gives you the impression of movement. You can see the flight pattern as they move across the sky. And this is one of my favorites is I think the pattern they made actually took on, on the shape of birds in flight. And I want to share my, my thought process on a shot. Uh, Jim is in charge of workshops for our camera club, and he loves ballet. So he set up a photo workshop with the local ballet company, the Brandywine Ballet, and they provided the dancers in their studio. We had camera club members bringing studio lights, and you know, it was a lot of fun. The dancers were amazing. I think everyone came away with shots that they were happy with, and I got I got quite a few as well. But in addition to shots like this one, I wanted something unique. There were 25 camera club members in the same place shooting the same dancers with the same poses. I wanted a shot that no one else in the group that day would have. I wanted this. So remember the story of Ansel Adams and the visualization, the combination of imagination and technique. I wanted to show a progression of movements. So I visualized this in advance and had to plan what I needed to do. So how did I do this? Well, most of the images were shot with a very fast shutter speed. That's why we brought all the high powered lights. 
So you can see here, this image was shot to freeze the amazing Amanda at the height of a leap. Note the high ISO and one one thousandth of a second. Now look what happens when we go with a much longer shutter speed of a third of a second. Now there's a blur that indicates movement. Well, it's a bad shot. I didn't want a two-faced Amanda, but I put this in to show you that you need to take a lot to get a few that you like. So here are the shots that I used straight out of camera. One, two, three, four. And this last one, I wanted her to face in the opposite direction. So I turned it around, put them all together in Photoshop for the finished image. And a different technique to show motion. I took multiple images in succession and then brought them in as layers in Photoshop. And by lowering the opacity of some of the images, there's just a subtle sense of graceful movement. And this was done the same way. And sometimes I like to just experiment. I wonder what would happen if I put a man to the ballet dancer inside one of my swirly hurricanes. It's kind of fun. And we drove by these giant wind turbines, and I thought I would try the same technique here. 20 images combined in Photoshop. Okay, the last series I will share shows some examples of images that began in my imagination, and then I had to figure out how to create it. Not the final shot nor the final model. Now I want to set up a dramatic shot and recreate Lizzie Borden. Have you heard of her? Lizzie Borden took an ax and gave her mother 40 wax. So I started by setting up the lighting and camera angle and Jim set up side lighting to create that scary look. And I actually have the camera lying on the floor. You can see I'm actually triggering the remote control. Uh, that's the remote control right there in my hand. Now I bring in the real model, our daughter, Alex, and try to get her to look menacing. She kept cracking up and took quite a few shots. So here I'm holding a fan to try to get her hair to fly up. First, I tried a hair dryer, and it wasn't powerful enough, so I, I held up an electric fan, and that, that put some motion in her hair. Making adjustments to the lighting, we had problems as the axe was kind of casting the shadow across the side of her face. Okay, a bit better. I did some editing. Finished image, Lizzie Borden makes me shudder. Another version from the same shoot in sepia to give it an old-time look. Still quite terrifying. And this is our other daughter. She looks a bit nicer, don't you think? Well, Jim and I watch a lot of photo videos and we like to practice lighting. And Jim is much better at it than I am. He set up this softbox light above Kelsey that I think provides this beautiful soft light. And for Kelsey, I didn't use a fan, brought in a leaf blower. Jim put a couple of colored gels on the lights. And I asked her to pose with a lantern like she was afraid and running away. So she plays a virtual game with friends called Pathfinders that includes dragons. So I envisioned a composite of her running through the forest chased by a dragon. So I photographed her Pathfinder dragon, went into my archives, found an image of the Redwood Forest in Oregon, added a bit of a blue tone in Photoshop, blended them together. Now I just need to add the dragon. And I don't like it. I think it looks kind of stupid. So, you know, not everything goes according to plan. So I scrapped the dragon, but I still kind of liked the image. And I thought, let me adjust the crop, add a light in the lantern and change the glow on her face to match the lantern light. So here's my finished image into the woods. And you can use your imagination as to what she is running from. Okay, two more examples. Our camera club, has a fun summer challenge. And a few years ago, the theme was song titles. And we were assigned 10 different song titles to illustrate with our photography. You may know the song, I Set Fire to the Rain by Adele. I immediately visualized this image that I wanted to create. I wanted it to rain water and I wanted it to rain fire on me. So I started with a shot of me in one of our canoes. Jim also built this one. I cropped in, I'm going to use this in the shot. And then I use the fire from that fire spinning workshop. And I will use some of these sparks in the final image. Then I needed rain. I asked Jim to hold up the hose at the garden, practiced with different shutter speeds, fast, a bit slower. I added clarity. Now I had my rain.
Next, I composited the rain, the sparks, and the image of me. You can see up here how I, I brought the layers in on an angle to hit the umbrella the way I wanted. All I need to do is add some sparks on the umbrella. Finished image. I set fire to the rain. So these summer challenges are a lot of fun, force us to think outside the box and get creative. And I have done some wacky and embarrassing stuff. This is the last one. <laughs> so you may know the song. It's all about that bass by Megan Trainer. Well, if you do, you know it's actually all about one's derriere. So an image popped into my mind. There was this rather famous image making its rounds on the internet of Kim Kardashian with her rather shapely butt. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I have no shame. I'm going to try to replicate this shot of Kim Kardashian. I did this when Jim went out as I was too embarrassed to even let him know what I was doing. So you can see I'm holding the remote in my hand. I'm trying different poses and I bring in the props. This is the one I went with. Remember those wine glasses with the splashing wine? Here they are again. Finished image. Yeah, it's pretty clear. I ain't no size two, but I can shake it, shake it like I'm supposed to do. Because, you know, I'm all about that base. So, yeah, you know, we get a bit stir crazy, maybe while stuck at home due to COVID, wildfire smoke, bad weather, whatever. But there are so many photo techniques you can learn and try out at home. You don't need to travel. Just experiment, try something new, and have fun. And I have had fun giving this presentation to you. And I thank you. So all of you, I say thank you. And I will share one more image with my contact info if you want to write it down. Our website is called letscapturethemoment.com. And if you go to a heading along the top called Photo Fun, you will see more in-depth info on many of the techniques I covered, those uh, swirlies that I did, the scanning, um, the multi-flash. A, a lot of that is on our website under Photo Fun. So, and uh, I think I have my, yeah, I have my email on there, bwilson1773 at gmail. If you want to try something after tonight and can't figure it out, if you want to send me a question, please feel free to. So with that, I will again say thank you. I will stop sharing my screen and open it up for any questions or comments. Thank you. Oh, I can see a silhouette of a hand clap. Oh, there, <laughs> there you are. Thank you. <laughs> Hang on one second, Betsy. We'll see who's got any questions. Okay. Thank you. Mm, I don't see any hands coming up. <laughs> well, hopefully I've inspired some people to try something new. Anyone learn anything new? <laughs> anything you want to try, hopefully. Amazing. Yeah. The big thing is to experiment. Yeah, yeah. You can tell we have a lot of fun trying new things. And again, that's the joy of, of photography. Tonight was about motion. I also photograph still lifes, which is very different and many, many different things. So yeah, we, we have a lot of fun with it. I hope you all do too. Okay. And Betsy, we'll, when we send out our um, an email after tonight, uh, include your email address. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, you, you have it because you've been emailing me, but it is bwilson1773 at gmail.com. So okay. if you want to put that in the email that you send out to your members, feel free to do that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Good luck with your uh, your uh, session that you do now. I'm sure you're going to have some wonderful images. So I will sign off, let you get on with your business. All right, so want to up your photography game. Uh, I think I might have just the thing for you. Okay. Have you heard about this new Lightroom special interest group? Um, Not really. Over at the YDAPC. SIG, they call it. It's pretty cool, actually. It's designed right. for, like, beginners and people who kind of know their way around a camera but want to learn more. Lightroom. Yeah. People like you who are ready to, like, really dive into Lightroom, you know, Unlock its potential, 
all that jazz. Oh, that sounds pretty cool, actually. I've been meaning to. Right. Yeah. And the best part, it's free if you're a YDAPC member already. Seriously. Totally. They've made it a part of like their whole educational program now, which I think is awesome. Shows they're really invested in their members, you know, helping them become better photographers. For sure. It's not just about the membership fees. It's about, you know, giving back to the community and fostering growth. Totally. Totally. So, okay, Lightroom. What is it about Lightroom that really speaks to you? Like, what are you hoping to achieve with it, photography-wise? Honestly, I want to learn how to really edit my photos. Like, yeah. make them pop, you know what I mean? I can take a decent picture, but the editing part, that's where I get lost. I feel that. And what I find interesting about this SIG is that they're not just throwing information at you. It's this whole two-pronged approach. Oh, tell me more. So you have your, like, Typical classroom sessions, right? Okay. Learning the concepts, the tools, all that good stuff. But then, and this is the cool part, they have these guided editing sessions. You actually work on your own photos. And Cindy Beachwood, she's the one leading it. Oh, wow. She gives you feedback directly. That's amazing. So you're not just like passively absorbing information. You're putting it into practice right away. Exactly. And with an expert like Cindy guiding you every step of the way, hmm. I think that's where the real learning happens, you know, uh, applying those skills, getting that kind of feedback. Totally. Although six months of monthly meetings, that's a commitment. I got to be honest. That's, yeah. It's a minute, especially, you know, for those of us with busy schedules and all. That's true. I mean, it, it's not something you just breeze through, you know. Right. But I see it as like an investment. Yeah. A real investment in yourself and your photography. Six months, meeting monthly, it provides a structure, a pace that feels, I don't know, manageable. You're not yeah. cramming everything in a single weekend and then forgetting half of it. Plus, they're doing everything on Zoom. Right, right. Sustainable growth rather than a quick fix. Exactly. And yeah, Zoom definitely makes it easier to fit into a busy schedule. No need to commute or anything. Speaking of Cindy... You know she was just named YDAPC's Spotlight Photographer, right, this month. Oh, wow, seriously. Yeah, I had no idea. Yeah, it just goes to show, right, the caliber of instruction you can expect from this SIG. For sure. Like, they wouldn't choose just anyone to lead this. Choosing Cindy for both the Spotlight Photographer and to lead this group, it really speaks to her expertise, not just in photography, but also in teaching. Completely agree. Imagine, right, honing your Lightroom skills, getting feedback directly from someone like Cindy Beachwood, YD APC Spotlight Photographer. Talk about an opportunity. So if you're even remotely interested, and I know you are. Oh, definitely. Her email is portsmouthco at gmail.com. You can reach out to her directly, learn more about the SIG, sign up, all that good stuff. Seriously, imagine where your photography could be in six months. Right. With that kind of, like dedicated learning, that expert feedback, exactly. the possibilities are endless. See, that's what I'm talking about. It's about taking that leap, investing in your craft. Mm. Picture yourself six months from now, confidently editing your photos, creating images that truly capture your vision. Who wouldn't want that? For sure. That's the dream. It really is. Lightroom Mastery, here I come. That's the spirit.